Fantastic. Well, welcome everybody. This is quite an odd thing for me to be giving a lecture to a window looking out on the park in Oxford at the, uh, at the, at the sunshine uh, with no audience at all. Um, but I'd like to um, give um, a brief talk about radiation damage in macromolecular crystal crystallography, I explain what it is and explain why um, some of us are spending our time trying to investigate it. However, before I get started, I would like to actually dedicate this um, uh, lecture to somebody uh, that many of you actually know, uh, looking at the list of participants who are listening, which is Professor Dame Louise Johnson, who is head of the Laboratory of Molecular uh, biophysics for uh, 17 years and uh, who died last week and whose funeral is on Saturday. She was a fantastic scientist and um, we were all going to miss her. Um, her uh, first um, uh, book, which was Blundell and Johnson, 1976, actually has a fantastic section on room temperature radiation damage and you can do a lot worse than starting with that but I've just looked at the web, and in fact, if you wanted a new copy of this book, you'd have to pay $500 on Amazon over. But there are some second-hand copies available. And if I were you, I'd snap one up while you can. Um, so um, our great dilemma as macromolecular crystallographers is that if we give um, an unattenuated beam incident on our crystal, we'll damage it pretty fast, uh, very fast at room temperature, and now at modern synchrotrons, it can be quite fast at cryo temperatures as well. But we get the high resolution data, but then we kill the crystal. On the other hand, if we put the attenuators in, we can get more data, but there's lower resolution. Um, so it's a dilemma about whether we um, increase the rate of damage by giving it the full beam, or we have the maximum and have the maximum diffraction intensity, or whether we cut down our diffraction intensity and also cut down the beam and the rate of damage. Um, so the variables involved here, um, I hope I'm going to cover during this web in, web in air, but it's a webinar, it's a web in air. So I'm going to cover what the symptoms are in protein crystallography, what's actually happening inside the crystal when we damage it, why we care, so the effect on mad and sad attempts at structure solution, um, talk about the x-axis when we plot the rate of damage, which is a quantity um, known as dose, and say how we calculated, and then very briefly, what we know a little bit about and what we'd like to know more about concerning radiation damage. So at room temperature, we get a nice diffraction pattern um, at the beginning of our um, experiment, and um, within one data set, or within sometimes um, three images, we see a loss of diffraction where we lose first the high resolution data at the edge of this SMAR image plate shown here, and um, the other reflections will um, extend and uh, the mosaicity will increase at the crystal as the experiment uh, in, um, proceeds. Um, this very nice picture taken on I-24, the micro focus beamline at Diamond uh, this year on a foot and round disease virus crystal from uh, David Stewart's group, a student called Abhay Kateka uh, here, shows uh, a room temperature image taken in situ in a uh, crystallization plate on a 40 micron crystal of foot and mouth disease virus uh, uh, mutant of it. And you can see that the first image is taken, then the um, crystal is moved to the next um, position, but by the time the, the uh, second image is taken, the place that was irradiated first has actually exploded. Similarly, the second position by the time the beam gets to the third, and so on, you can see that the whole crystal explodes. And um, this beamline now has its own room temperature crystal etched logo that you can see on the left here, I24, um, etched into a crystal by the beam um, being moved across it. So the first systematic study of radiation damage in protein crystals uh, was by Colin Blake and David Phillips. And in fact, I heard from Colin Blake last week, and he's still alive living um, in Norfolk, uh, retired now, but they came to three very important conclusions. One was that the damage was proportional to the dose at room temperature. So what's the dose? Well, the dose is the energy lost by the beam, so the absorbed photons um, that get stuck in the crystal, if you like, that don't make it out the other side. So they're not diffracting, because diffraction is a, an elastic uh, um, process that the photons that are absorbed by the crystal, it's the amount of energy they lose per kilogram of crystal. And those of you growing nanocrystals or very small microcrystals will not 
take kindly to the idea that something's measured in kilograms of protein crystals, but that's the SI unit um, of dose. So this finding that dose is um, the, the, the damage is proportional to the amount of energy lost by the beam in the crystal has become a basic assumption and has been shown in some elegant uh, experiments by Rob Storm's group to be true uh, at 100 Kelvin. They also um, came to the conclusion that eight uh, that one 8 kV photon, which is a copper K alpha photon, if it was absorbed by the crystal, it will disrupt up to 70 molecules. They were um, doing this on myoglobin, and it will somewhat disorder another 90. So you can see that's actually a huge effect for one absorbed photon. Amazingly, they came to the conclusion that the damage might be structurally specific, i.e. there might be some amino acids that were more susceptible to damage than others and would damage faster. They didn't even know the sequence of myoglobin at the time, and they thought that the damaged residues might be isoleucines or leucines, but we now know that they're disulfide bonds um, which uh, get damaged first. Now, this was confirmed um, by Greg Petzo's group uh, and Dagmar Ringer, but not actually, um, uh, not actually published and reported in a paper by John Helliwell 26 years later at room temperature and then 38 years later at 100 Kelvin. So they really were away in, before their time. And they came up with the idea that the functional form of this intensity decay didn't fit a simple exponential. But you can see here there needed to be a fraction that was unchanged, which is the A1 term at the beginning of this, which is time dependent because the fraction unchanged will decrease with time. And then the fraction that's severely disordered and the rest of it becomes completely amorphous. So a proportion the whole minus A1 minus A2 will become uh, will, will be uh, completely useless in terms of ordered uh, material and therefore it won't diffract anymore. And this just shows their experiment. They monitored um, a few reflections, um, took some data sets, reflections over a, um, a resolution range, which is what the x-axis here is, and you can see that they divided their second data set by the first data set, and then the second by the second and third. Uh, sorry, the third by the um, the the, first, the second, etc. And saw gradually that the high resolution uh, data damaged faster or disappeared. The intensity went down faster than it did at low resolution, and they came up with this model. So they then fitted their seven data sets to the these um, A2 and A1 terms and plotted those as a function of exposure time, and this is 300 hours on a um, uh, anode, uh, not a rotating anode, on a sealed tube anode. And it's measured in rad, because that used to be the unit of dose, but now the unit is gray. Um, and they came to the conclusion that half of it would be um, destroyed, the, uh, half of the crystal volume would be gone by the time we got to 0.6 of a mega gray. Uh, and there was no other uh, quantitative measurement of this um, for many, many years after this experiment. So in the early 1990s, protein crystallographers started to cryocool crystals. As the third generation synchrotrons came online, the crystals damaged extremely quickly at the ESRF, which was the first third generation synchrotron. And cryocooling to 100K um, saved the day because approximately 70 times more data could be collected at 100K than it could at room temperature. And I'll come back to this number um, uh, later on. So you can see on the top right here that at 120K, if you look at the exposure number, the intensity stays um, high, whereas at the equivalent experiment at 300K, this would decay away the intensity um, of the diffraction pattern. And that what's plotted on the y-axis there is I over sigma I. On the one below, you can see that at 120K, you can collect higher resolution data than you could at room temperature. This is because you've got longer to collect it before the side chains and so on are damaged at 100K, rather than the crystal diffracting better intrinsically at 100K than it did at 300K. So the process involved here, you can see the picture of the molecules. They've got rather tenuous crystal contacts. I'm afraid it must be a membrane protein crystal. Um, that there's two types of event. The red ones there are the direct, um, uh, the um, other primary events, which um, should produce up to 500 secondary electrons, which are the pink ones. 
Um, these can then interact either with protein, which is a direct event. So the one at the bottom, at the left-hand side, is a red uh, event directly on the protein. So the photon is involved, um, absorbed by the by the protein. Got photons and proteins here, and I'm getting my tongue twisted. Um, so the photon is absorbed by the protein directly, and it will do uh, direct damage to it. Whereas the one uh, further up, the red one on the left, that is an indirect event where the photon is absorbed by the solvent and will produce a cascade of reactions, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, the um, division between primary and secondary events is slightly uh, fuzzy and is uh, defined differently in different fields. And here I will say that a, a high energy photoelectron coming out is a primary photoelectron, but everything that follows in the cascade of damage will be a secondary product. However, even at cryo temperatures, we started to see damage to crystals, and this is 19 hours um, of a Salmonella typhimurium uraminidase crystal um, at SSRL in 1998, and you can see that on the top left is a photograph of the crystal with a yellow discoloring in it. I then took it off and put it back in the crab buffer, and it took off like those insects that run across the tops of ponds uh, with their suction legs and uh, let off gas and broke up. I re-cryocooled um, the um, remainder of the crystal at sea, and it still diffracted to better than one angstrom, which is what the uh, original crystal had. What this shows us is that at cryo temperatures, this damage does not travel very far through the crystal while we're collecting data, and we can take a number of uh, exposures. Um, it's been shown by Bob Fischetti's group at the APS that probably the maximum damage from the edge of where the beam is on the crystal is about three microns that the, uh, that the secondary electrons can travel. So as long as you do your subsequent images on your crystal, translate it to leave three microns of spare space between the uh, beam, one beam position and the next beam position, uh, you should not get damage on your second um, uh, translated position. So, that was at a second generation synchrotron, but you can see that the brightness of these synchrotrons has increased incredibly. We've got the electron impact X-ray tubes introduced around um, uh, the late 1890s, um, and up until 1960, there wasn't much increase in intensity. On the unit on the on the y-axis here is pretty impossible. It's the average spectral brightness, which is the photons per second per square millimeter per square milliradian per 0.1% bandwidth. So the um, energy of the X-rays um, is monochromatic to within 0.1% per 1%. Um, X-ray tubes were um, introduced, rotating anodes were introduced um, in the uh, mid-60s, and then we got multi-layer optics in-house, but then bending magnets at second-generation synchrotrons and then wigglers and undulators at third-generation synchrotrons have taken us up um, nine orders of mag magnitude from what we can get in-house to our synchrotron experiments. And now, of course, the free electron laser has taken up uh, even more orders of magnitude and is off the top of this graph. So cryocool crystals um, at the ESRS, this shows a translated um, uh, iron-containing protein uh, given to me by Tassos Barakis, showing the black marks on the top picture where the beam has been incident and uh, given about five images per position, uh, five to ten images per position, and then when allowed to warm up, the whole crystal um, breaks up and lets off gas, thought to be hydrogen from work um, from alkamines, um, which I'll refer to again later. Um, spectral changes are also observed at cryo temperatures. Um, the one on the right is um, actually a, a helium called a crystal at 16K, and it's a phosphate buffer which goes bright red. Um, at the bottom, you see a bluish color, which many of you would have seen on your cryocool crystals, and this is a solvated electron absorption peak at um, around uh, 580 down to 550 nanometers, depending on how much glycerol or other cryo protectant you have in there, that peak moves uh, with the concentration of glycerol. So at cryo temperatures, now we see a lovely diffraction pattern at the beginning. And then either within one data set, or if it's a, um, uh, a bit more robust crystal, um, you see after data set 10 this is, you see the same thing that I showed you right at the beginning um, at room temperature, which is a loss of high resolution spots. 
and a general de de uh, degradation of the diffraction pattern. What you also find is that the unit cell volume expands, we think, because hydrogen collects at um, domain boundaries and is unable to escape because of the cryopulled conditions uh, being held in an amorphous glass. And you also see an increase in Wilson B factors. In terms of your actual structure, at the end, you see an increase in the atomic B factors. Uh, you also see our merge uh, getting worse. Um, and if we look at the fluxes here, in 2000, we had um, on ID 14.4 at the ESRF, 1 times 10 to the 12 photons per second into 100 microns by 100 microns. Um, the Australian synchrotron, when I visited it in 2008, they had 3 times 10 to the 13 photons into 50 by 70, which is equivalent to 10 to the 14 photons into 100 by 100. And ID, uh, sorry, I24 at Diamond, uh, a few weeks ago, there's 1 times 10 to the 12 photons per second into 10 by 10. So the area is very important because it's not just the flux, it's the flux density that matters. So how many photons do we have going into a small area? How many are actually going to hit our crystal and what proportion of those will be absorbed? What we observe at cryo temperatures in terms of the intensity loss, if we take subsequent data sets, this is for apoferritin, which is a large um, uh, iron storage protein. The APO uh, um, version of it has no iron in the center. Um, it makes a 20-former ball of about 78 angstroms across, and that's filled with iron when it's storing iron, and it's uh, got no iron in, in the APO form. So these are subsequent data sets from three different crystals, and you can see that um, you can model the uh, total intensity of the data set integrated from 2.2 angstroms up to 58 angstroms by a linear decay. Um, at high resolution, um, this is slightly exponential, the decay of the high resolution shells. But for the whole data set, this can be well modeled by a straight line. So we can define the dose, that's the energy absorbed per kilogram of crystal, that is required to take this crystal from diffraction of, of normalized to one down to half of its diffracting intensity as the dose to half intensity. And again, I'll come back to that. So the other things that happen at 100 Kelvin, and this is from a paper by Ravelli and McSweeney, the fingerprint that um, X-rays leave on structures um, in structure from 2000, is the mosaicity increases, but not in any uh, uh, helpfully reproducible way. It can be rather different between crystals of the same protein on the same day. The Wilson B goes up, the unit cell volume goes up, um, and this is for um, two different, um, three different proteins. Uh, there's four plots there because one is for, the red one is henegoat lysozyme unattenuated, and the um, green one is for attenuated. And here the x-axis is not dose, it's data set. And you can see that the green one and the red one aren't doing the same thing. But if we put them on a common scale, which would be the dose, um, then they would um, actually agree much better with one another. The fourth thing that can happen is really quite um, alarming, which is that the molecule can actually um, rotate within the unit cell, within the minimum translatable unit. And what this means is that um, we get non-isomorphism within one data set because the unit cell is increasing and the molecule is rotating within the unit cell. Crick and, uh, Francis Crick and Beatrice Magdoff showed in 1956 um, that if a unit cell of 100 by 100 by 100 increased by 0.5 angstroms on each dimension, then the intensity of the reflection at three angstroms would go up by 15%, or would change rather by 15%. This is a terrifying number because it means that if your unit cell volume uh, changes, then so do your diffraction intensities, and you've got an intrinsic non-isomorphism built into one data set from the unit cell expansion and also the rotation of the molecule within the unit cell. So to summarize what we see um, in terms of the global parameters, at 100 Kelvin, we see the intensity going down. The sigma i tends to go up, so that overall quantity will go down. The resolution limit will um, get higher, but that means the resolution actually goes down. So we'll go, say, from 2 angstroms to 4 angstroms. Our merging r values will go up. Our scaling b factors will go up. Mosaicity will tend to increase. And the unit cell will expand, both as a function of dose, but also of cryogen 
um, cryogen temperature. If you allow your um, uh, cryo stream to go up in temperature, so will your unit cell. Could you use the unit cell to actually monitor your radiation damage rate and throw your crystal away when it is increased by, say, 1% um, or 2%? Well, systematic experiments by uh, Raymond Ravelli's group and by us uh, in 2002 showed that actually this wasn't a good metric because, again, if crystals of the same protein, the same size on the same day, tend to uh, expand at different rates and you couldn't use it as a um, general metric. So what global damage metric should we use? I've said that I over SIG I, um, that SIG I goes up and I goes down. So that's not a very good indicator. I've showed you some plots already of um, the, the um, intensity, the integrated intensity of a total data set over the integrated intensity of the first data set, um, giving a linear decrease. Could we use the B factor, or could we use the increase in our merge or an our merge type measure to monitor global radiation damage? So um, Kai Diedrich came up with the um, idea, this, this was also used in a uh, paper by Schlich, um, Harrison and uh, uh, Rosenbaum in uh, 2003, of looking at pairwise R factors between identical uh, reflections, which have been measured at different doses, so at different points in the data collection. But instead of taking just the image number along the x-axis, the difference in image number, or the difference in the dose is taken. If you have no damage, you don't expect the disagreement or the, um, the uh, internal disagreement between reflections to go up. Um, and so you would expect this to be the straight line, as you can see from the green dotted line there. However, if as the dose, the difference in dose between these uh, measured, um, the measurements of these reflections, as that increases, the difference between them would increase because of the factors that I've already mentioned. Um, so the damage then would go up uh, more or less um, linearly um, with, with the difference in dose. This is done following scaling um, and is really a, a measuring the, the non-isomorphism that's induced by the radiation damage in the crystal. The second thing we can use is the um, B factor. Uh, and this is a very nice paper to which I refer you by Rob Thorne's group and Kometco in 2006, in which they um, use the difference in the relative B factor um, as the metric and fitted the slope of that, plotting dose against the relative B, so the first data set um, is subtracted from subsequent data sets to get the uh, delta B. And then the slope of that um, divided by 8 pi squared gives a quantity called SAD, S-A-D, S sub A-D, um, the sensitivity of the crystal. And they found in that paper that um, the range of, the, they measured four different crystals, and Henneg White last time had a sensitivity of 0.012 angstrom squared per gray and Thangwerton of 0.018, a 50% increase. Um, but these numbers seem to be within around a factor of two. Um, the sensitivity is, is, is not that different of protein crystals, um, probably dependent on solvent content and also solvent distribution within the crystal. The second thing, the second big class of thing we see is specific structural damage, as noted by Blake and Phillips all those years ago. Um, and um, the disulfide bonds go first. They are the most susceptible to radiation damage. They're the most electrophilic group within the protein. In other words, they love to capture an electron and be reduced. So what you can see here are the four disulfide bonds in um, hen egg white lysozyme. Um, and uh, I hope you can see them. I can't point them out to you, unfortunately. Oh, yes, maybe I can. I hope you can see my pointer. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there, and there's one here. Um, so this is a different density map between the data and the model. The model having all the disulfides in and the data, they've become disordered, they've gradually elongated and then broken due to radiation damage. The aspartates and glutamates are all also decarboxylated, and the third thing to go are the OH groups from tyrosine residues. Then the CS bond in methionine is broken. And it's important to realize here that the biggest cross-section for the X-rays is, of course, the sulfur atoms if you've got no metals in your protein. And so if there were no secondary processes going on here, we would expect the damage to be in the order of the cross-section that the atom um, 
gave to the x-rays, so we'd expect the disulfides to go, and then the CS bond in the thionine, because it has sulfur in. The fact that this is not the order that they go in tells us that there's something that's mobile at 100 Kelvin in our protein crystals that's actually sinking to the disulfide bonds and then to the um, aspartates and glutamates and then the OH bond uh, on tyrosine. Now, this reproducible order has been seen in uh, a good number of proteins now and is, a, is, is a, a clear signal. So we've got our global damage shown on the left there, intensity loss, cell volume um, increase, and increased scaling B values. We've got our um, B um, values, atomic B values increasing. So down here is shown um, apoferritin um, and... Um, yes, it's apoferritin. Sorry, I'm just, I just had a brain, brain seizure then. Yes, it's definitely apo, well, it's a monomer of apoferritin. And you can see that the, uh, the atomic B factors have gone up by data set 10 by 70%. And that's why it's purple and red instead of blue. And here we see a 2FO minus FC map of an aspartate residue, and then an FO minus FC, and then an FO minus FC of a disulfide bond. So just in summary of what I've said, that's the order of um, damage that we observe. Uh, we also, if we have heavier atoms covalently bound to our, uh, in our protein, we see breakage of C, bromine bonds, C, iodine, and uh, um, any covalently bond mercuries will also see damaged. Okay, so what's going on here? What's actually happening when the X-rays hit our protein crystal? Well, we've got the bit we want, which is the diffraction, but also, if you put anything in the way of an X-ray beam, some X-rays will be absorbed, which is why, of course, you can tell if you've broken your bone, um, because you get um, higher absorption by the bone than by the tissue, so you can see the gap where you've um, hit the football too hard and got a breakage. So um, that absorption means that the X-ray is losing energy in the crystal, and that energy is available to break the chemical bond. Um, at one angstrom incident wavelength, which is 12.4 keV, 90% of the X-ray beam just goes straight through a 100 micron thick crystal and doesn't interact at all. So of the bit that does interact, we're now going to look at the processes. So the first one we want is the diffraction. So that's an elastic scattering event with no energy loss at all. You can see the X-ray coming in, going out again at the same wavelength. And of the X-rays that interact at all with the crystal, that's 8% of what happens at 12.4 keV. The second thing that can happen is a Thompson or Raleigh, um, sorry, that's, that's still the, um, uh, the coherent scattering that gives us our diffraction pattern, and it's the bit we want. So that's the elastic scattering. The second thing is a Compton scattering, where uh, an X-ray impinges on an electron, an, on an atom, and then loses some energy to it ejects an X-ray, sorry, ejects an electron, uh, but not at the full energy um, of the X-ray, and the X-ray goes um, out of the crystal with missing some energy that it's donated to that electron, um, but it's an inelastic scattering event, and most of these uh, scattered X-rays will probably escape from the crystal and not lose their energy within it. And this process is, uh, doesn't have a high, very high probability at 12.4 kV and only becomes important if you're using an X-ray beam higher in energy than about 25 kV, in which case you need to consider it as a component of the damage um, contrib contrib contributing mechanism. The third and much the worst, um, the third, last and main interaction is photoelectric absorption, where the X-ray is totally absorbed by the atom and ejects a photoelectron, primary photoelectron that I've already referred to, from the atom um, with almost the full energy of that incident X-ray. It's the full energy minus the binding energy of that electron around the atom. And this is 84% of all the interactions at one angstrom. Um, and that primary photoelectron has enough energy to give rise to up to 500 ionization events, and it leaves the atom in an excited state. That can e either de-excite by the emission of an OJ electron, which is absorbed by the crystal, or if it's a higher Z element, you can get a fluorescent X-ray, which can escape the crystal and therefore not lose all the energy of that incident X-ray in the crystal. 
So this photoelectric cross-section is measured in a crazy unit called Barnes, uh, Barnes, and a barn is 10 to the minus 28 meters squared, and it's an area. Uh, this is the sort of thing nuclear physicists think is a great joke. I used to be one, and a barn was obviously something tiny like a barn for hay. So a few heavy atoms in your crystal could make a huge difference to the photoelectric cross-section to your X-ray beam. You can probably see a pinpoint here, one pixel of my PowerPoint, which is the cross-section of hydrogen. Then we have carbon, which is slightly bigger. This is still organic elements. Nitrogen's okay, oxygen's okay. Sulfur is uh, much bigger. So these are the area of these is proportional to the cross-section in barns for an X-ray beam at 13.1 kV, which is just below one angstrom. But if you have a selenium derivative, because you're trying to phase from it, and you had a native, and you wonder why your selenium only lasted half as long in the X-ray beam, it's because that is the cross-section of selenium, which has a Z of 30, um, 34. So you can see that small, a small number of, 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 of heavy atoms in your crystal going to make a huge difference to the absorption coefficient of the crystal. So here's a Henegger white lysozyme crystal, 100 microns thick, a 1 angstrom beam, 12.4 keV, and it's been derivatized at 1 platinum per Henegger white lysozyme molecule, and it will absorb twice as much beam as it would if it was a native crystal. So this gives you an idea of what's really important is not the incident flux, although that matters, it's what you've got in your crystal is going to determine how much energy is absorbed by it and therefore what the dose is and therefore how fast it will actually uh, damage in the beam. So what can you do about this as, a, as, as an experimenter? Well, if you have heavy atoms in your solvent, which are not actually contributing to the diffraction pattern, so not helping you solve your structure, it's a really good idea to try back soaking to remove them. Because cocodylate buffer, buffer uh, for instance, has arsenic in it, which has a Z of 33, which has a very similar cross-section to that of selenium, which I've just shown you. And if you have brominated DNA protein complex, for instance, that will damage much faster than something that's not brominated. And there's a nice reference to uh, a careful experiment on that. So what's actually going on with the radiation chemistry? So we've looked at the physics of this, which is the energy loss, um, as the um, photons are absorbed in the crystal. What's going on in the solvent? Well, we get uh, radiolysis of water. These are the interactions at room temperature and neutral pH. And you can see that the main radicals produced are the electron, E minus, and an OH radical here. Um, the OH radical at 100K is not thought, to be, um, not thought to be mobile, but the electron we know is mobile. That's been observed in, ES, in electron spin resonance experiments to be able to run along the amino acid backbone a bit like a motorway and find the most electrophinic site, which is the disulfide bond. So here is a, an electron doing just that. We've got an O minus there, and um, this electron can travel along the amino acid uh, backbone to, um, to a weak point, if you like, or an affinic site. Now, there's two processes that are going on here. There's um, hopping, which can happen if there's any thermal energy at all, and even at 100K, there is some thermal energy in the crystal or quantum mechanical tunneling, which is a temperature-independent effect, and there's nothing much we can do to stop quantum mechanical tunneling. So this will happen even at 4 Kelvin, um, the, the quantum mechanical tunneling with. So the third um, unsung, um, um, what can we say, uh, bad, <coughs> uh, bad, bad thing in this is a uh, proton hole. Um, so we can uh, lose a proton from the cationic site, and that hole can travel around along by an electron moving the other way. Um, and these are the mechanisms by which we can move um, energy around at, room, at um, 100K. Why do we care about this damage? Um, well, the, um, there are several reasons why we care. One of them is the effect on structure solution. So if we're doing a MAD or a, a, a multi a, a multi-wavelength anomalous dispersion experiment or a single wavelength one. I've mentioned already two um, sources of non-isomorphism within one data set, which will cause trouble. Quite often, our signal for MAD or SAD is only 4 to 
of the reflection intensity. And if they're changing by, well, I mentioned the figure of 15% at three angstroms for a 0.5 angstrom, 0.5% cell change for a 100 angstrom unit cell, you can see that you're going to wash out your MAD or SAD signal very quickly because of this non-isomorphism. The third source of non-isomorphism is the fact that um, uh, structural changes are occurring actually during the experiment, and that means that my structure is giving different reflection intensities with or without the disulfide bonds, and I've got a spectrum of different damage states within my crystal. If you imagine a Gaussian beam shape uh, and a crystal that spans most of that shape, then you, as you rotate it in the beam, the center of the crystal is becoming very um, strongly irradiated as a high dose in the center with much lower dose at the edges. So the unit cells in the middle of the crystal will be expanding and the ones around the outside won't expand so much. And I've got a spread both of um, specific structural damage throughout that crystal and a spread of non-isomorphism due to cell expansion and movement of the molecule within the unit cell, and that means that what I'm seeing in my electron density map is an average of many different states of my biological molecule. The radiation damage will also possibly affect our biological results because we might have a mechanism that we're trying to untangle from our biological molecule, which relies, for instance, on an aspartate or a glutamate at the uh, active site, which will be decarboxylated by radiation damage. Metalloproteins uh, will photoreduce in the first few milliseconds of an experiment at 100 Kelvin. Um, and Photosystem 2 is a very nice example of this uh, reduction of the manganese um, actually during the experiment. And the Japanese group have spent many years untangling the intermediates of bacteria rhodopsin to try to separate the ones induced by X ray um, uh, impinging on the bacteria rhodopsin as opposed to real structural intermediates that have biological re uh, relevance. So, the fact that these artifacts caused by radiation damage can change the conclusions which we reach from our biological experiments is something that um, protein crystallographers need to be made aware. So, in summary, what we see is a loss of diffraction, specific structural damage. We can end up with the wrong biological information. Our structure determination can fail, and I won't say any more about ultra-high resolution data, apart from that a few bad images, radiation damaged ones, can really pollute the electron density map. So what is dose and how do we calculate it? I've already mentioned dose several times. It's the energy absorbed per unit mass of crystal, and it's measured in GRAY, gray, GY for short, capital G, lowercase y, and it's the number of joules lost per kilogram of crystal. It's measured um, as absorbed energy per unit mass, and it's a fundamental metric against which we measure damage. So we can plot I over I0, we can plot VREL against it, um, we can plot um, our RD against the difference in the dose between the reflections that we measure. The flux, conversely, is in photons per second, and the flux density that I've already mentioned is in photons per second per unit area. The concept of dose takes care of the physics involved in these processes, but not of the chemistry that might be going on. So, for instance, if our lattice happened to have an aspartate or a, um, uh, a glutamate at a crystal contact, the lattice might collapse and our diffraction disappear well before we'd lost very much energy in the crystal just because that's a susceptible amino acid and it would be the it would go after the disulfide bond pretty soon. So the dose postulate uh, which was proposed by Richard Henderson in 1990 says that there's a maximum dose in joules per kilogram which protein crystals or other biological samples can tolerate and that will depend on the physics of the energy loss of the situation. The crystals might not reach this limit because of chemical factors, uh, like the one I've already uh, um, mentioned, but it might not, would not be expected to last beyond this limit. In order to know what you're dealing with, of course, you've got to be able to calculate the dose. And with Raymond Ravelli, um, we've written a program called RADDOSE, which we're developing more at the moment to be three-dimensional and to model more complicated crystal shapes, etc that allows protein crystallographers to um, uh, more conveniently calculate the energy loss in their crystals because you can put in the buffer components in millimolar concentration. 
So just to give you an idea of this unit, if we um, if we uh, take a, a crystal, hundred uh, by a hundred crystal in a one angstrom beam, and 12, uh, 10 to the 12 photons per second are incident on it, one megagray will be absorbed in 20 seconds. So a megagray is a huge dose. This little hamster down on the right here, I haven't done the experiment, I hasten to add, um, will die if, if three gray are delivered to him. So that is three joules per kilogram of hamster. And a human brain with a tumor, 60 gray is the maximum in 30 times two gray doses that uh, we can treat humans with brain tumors. So this mega gray is 10 to the six gray. This is absolutely amazing that our protein crystals withstand this dose. Um, and in order to calculate the dose that you're delivering or that you're being absorbed by your um, protein crystal, you need to characterize both the beam and the crystal. So the, the crystal, we need to know what exactly is in it. So we've got amino acids, we've perhaps got selenium in it, we've perhaps got a mercury derivative. We might have bound some DNA to our crystal, so we've got phosphorus. We might have sodium chloride in the buffer. These are all going to absorb more than the organic elements for the photoelectric cross-section. We might have a phosphate buffer. So we need to know the number of amino acids in our unit cell, the um, number of heavy atoms per monomer of our protein molecule, and the solvent concentration components. Of course, you don't know these exactly because you've crystallized your protein and you've got some equilibrium between the well and the drop, but you can make an estimate of what it might be. So for the, for the crystal, we need to know all of these things so we, we can then calculate the absorption coefficient, so what the cross-section um, of the uh, atoms is to the beam. And if we take apoferritin for a one angstrom beam, we get 0.4 millimeters to the minus one for the absorption coefficient, whereas holoferritin, the iron fold one, is nearly double um, because there is one iron atom for every two amino acids in holoferritin and it's the heaviest um, metal content protein that I know of. If you know of another one, please do email me, um, or, or one that's even heavier. The beam characteristics we need to know are the size and profile of the beam, the exposure time, and the flux. Given all this, we can calculate the dose. So we did this experiment on ferritin, um, apoferritin and holoferritin. The holoferritin would absorb twice as much beam um, for the same incident flux as the, whole, as the apoferritin, and we came up with a dose to half intensity limit for protein crystallography of 43 megagray. For those of you who've, uh, who, are, who know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I really wanted the answer to be 42 um, megagray, but it came out as 43 with an error bar obviously on it. What was very interesting about this is that for these two proteins, uh, under, crystallized in the same conditions, um, they had absorption coefficients different by a factor of two, uh, which meant you only had to give half of the number of photons to the holoferritin that you did to the apoferritin to um, get this dose, but that the uh, numbers came out so similarly. So um, Richard Henderson had predicted from electron diffraction that the limit for protein crystallography would be 20 megagray and uh, the number we obtained was 43 megagray. However, when we looked at the electron density maps, they were rather compromised um, because this is the dose to half intensity for the whole data set. So the high resolution data were very damaged by this stage. And so um, by looking at the electron density maps, we came up with a dose uh, limit of 30 megagray, which corresponds to 0.7 of the intensity being left. So a loss of 0.3. Interestingly, in Blundell and Johnson, um, they say if you have a room temperature radiation damaged crystal, you should throw it away when it's got down to 85% of its original intensity. But if you're short of crystals, you would be allowed to go down to 70% of the original intensity, which is the number we independently came up with for 100 Kelvin experiments. So we have this limit of 30 megagray. We don't really want to give our protein crystals more than that. They might not last up until that. So what does this mean for an experiment on the sources that we have now? Well, on a microfocus multilayer um, X-ray generator in-house, giving about three times 10 to the nine photons per second into a 200 micron 
uh, area, that's 70 gray per second on an organic crystal with nothing heavy in it. Um, you've got five days before you reach this limit, 30 megagray. On an undulated synchrotron beamline, like the one I mentioned, um, as was ID 14.4 in 2000, you've got five minutes. But on ID 24, for in, uh, sorry, I 24 at Diamond um, Synchrotron, this is actually into a 10 by 10. This is into a 10 by 10 beam. You've got about three seconds before you reach this dose limit. So you can start to see that um, these are very serious X-ray beams, and that you have to consider the damage. So what's the que the question is? What's the dose limit at room temperature? Uh, well, at 100 K, we think that the dose limit is not dependent on the rate at which you deliver the dose, or it's only um, it's only weakly dependent on it. We um, changed the dose rate by a factor of 10, and we got a 10% change in the um, D a half at 100 K. But at room temperature, there is a number of measurements out there um, now showing that this is probably dose rate dependent. So it will depend on what dose, you, dose rate you're delivering it what the ratio of room temperature to 100 K gain is. From this number of 43 megagray and the Blake and Phillips number of 0.6 megagray, you get an approximate um, gain of 70, which is where this number of 70 comes from. But I think that that number is going to change over the next year or two as more measurements at room temperature are carried out. Room temperature crystallography is becoming uh, back in vogue because of in situ irradiation of crystals in trays which allows you to take data and hold data sets actually without interfering with the crystal or even taking it out of the tray. Um, and also, um, a number of uh, virus crystals don't like being cryocooled at all. So people are becoming more interested in room temperature data collection again. So finally, um, what do we know and what would we like to know about radiation damage in protein crystals? Well, we've got a huge number of variables here that we can change and see if they make any effect on the rate of radiation damage. So our X-ray beam, we can vary the flux, that's the photons per second, the flux density, photons per second per square millimeter, the wavelength or energy of our X-ray beam, the dose, the dose rate, the beam size compared with the crystal size. We can put attenuators in, or we can defocus our beam to get a different shaped beam. I've already mentioned the Gaussian beam tends to fry the middle of the crystal and leave the outside relatively undamaged. So a top hat shaped beam can be a better way um, to actually radiate your crystal. So defocusing can be a beneficial thing to do in principle. I'm not sure there's an experiment that actually proves that yet. The cryostat, should we be collecting um, data at helium temperatures below 100? Well, there's a world shortage of helium, um, and there is some um, worry about that currently. Um, so we've got to be very convinced that helium would give us a lot more information if we're going to use open flow helium and lose it to the atmosphere. And then um, the actual crystal in the loop, we've got an enormous number of variables there, and some of these are very hard to control. Obviously, the heavy atom content matters, and I've already mentioned back soaking, the solvent content, the solvent composition, the crystal size, its surface to volume ratio of the crystal, depending on how good a cryo cool we manage to do. So the bigger the crystal, the harder it is to cool well. Uh, the amount of residual liquid around the crystal, does that affect what happens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to do um, statistically significant experiments under control conditions is not a trivial task. And how do we know we're making any difference to the rate of radiation damage? We need a good online metric where we can actually say, throw your crystal away when X, Y, Z happens or when it dies this far. Now, progress has been made on this, uh, particularly using BEST, which is a predictive program and allows you to get um, a data collection strategy in conjunction with the RAD dose calculation on how much energy you're losing in your crystal. But there's a big problem in that the structural changes in the crystal will actually occur before any degradation in your um, diffraction quality is obvious. And at the moment, there are the various metrics are um, giving not quite the same results for scavenger experiments or um, dose rate experiments. So work going on so far, and I'm not going to go through all these, but should we lower the temperature? Should we lower the wavelength? The ratio of the diffraction strength over the absorption or the dose 
stays approximately constant over the 7 kV to sort of 14 kV range used for protein crystallography. So in principle, there shouldn't be much improvement or change by changing the uh, energy of the beam over that range. But of course, detector efficiencies can change with wavelengths, and there are lots of other things that can change. Um, anecdotal evidence um, says that it's better to be higher energy, but um, there's experimental evidence, uh, conflicting experimental evidence, which shows it does make a difference or it doesn't, make, and, and also that it doesn't make any difference. Should we use the unit cell expansion as a metric? No. Um, what about the effect on Madden Sad um, with minimum crystal size? There's several papers on that. Beam heating at the current flux densities is not thought to be a, um, an issue. Uh, elegant uh, experiments by Eddie Snell have shown that at our current flux densities that shouldn't be making a difference. Um, the important parameters for X-ray absorption have been defi uh, defined, the physics defines them. What about removing oxygen to stop radical species interacting with it? There's nothing on that yet. The radiation damage induced phasing, you can take a low dose data set and then burn your crystal to get rid of the disulfide bond ordering and then take another data set to find the lack of sulfur and use that as an inverse heavy atom experiment. Software developments have been huge progress in that um, zero dose extrapolation, predictive um, programs such as BEST and um, uh, also pipeline to make it easier for experimenters to know what's going on. Adding radical scavengers, the results um, the, disagree on that. Um, we think there are some that are effective. Um, biological implications and ap applications of mechanistic studies, there's now many of those. And um, the room temperature studies are ongoing. The dose rate affects um, the results at the moment disagree. There's been a series of radiation damage workshops and for those of you more interested to follow up on radiation damage, um, I just show the special issues of Journal of Synchrotron Radiation that have been devoted to papers from these workshops. So there's 2001, eight papers, 2003, nine papers. Then there's one in 2007, 14 papers in 2009, eight papers. One in May 2011, there's 10 papers. And there's another one in preparation, which will be coming out in January 2013. Uh, with a number of papers that are being prepared at the moment in that. So what can you do um, to, if you're an average experimenter and you want to try to be aware of radiation damage artifacts and also avoid it, you can't avoid it completely, but um, you shouldn't be afraid to merge data from, taken from different um, isomorphous crystals or even non-isomorphous crystals, as a, a recent uh, paper in Science by Wayne Hendrickson's group has shown. Um, but Merging data which all have lower doses can give you a better data set than taking a very damaged data set uh, where you've got the complete data set um, but the end of it was really compromised. I've already mentioned back soaking and non specifically bound heavy atoms. Uh, you need to be absorption aware, so do remember that your selenium um, derivative crystal, your selenium met crystal, will probably last half as long in the same crystallization conditions as your native. And then match the beam size to the crystal size again. There's debates about this, and uh, there's some sophisticated modeling going on at the moment. Um, try scavengers. Electron scavengers at 100K, they're the only ones that would have any effect. And of those, nitrate, ascorbate, and benzoquinone we found to be effective. The nitrate makes a, fa a big factor of difference on the specific damage, and nitrate and ascorbate a factor of two um, on the global damage. But we're not talking about factors of 10 here, unfortunately. Consider dose spreading using a top hat profile beam rather than a Gaussian beam if you can, a defocused beam, or helical translational data collection. This helical data collection is now uh, available on some beam lines. But so you can estimate your dose, you should ask at your beam line, what is the flux per day at this energy with this slip size? What's the flux density? And what is the profile today of this beam? Uh, at this beam energy and the full width half maximum in X and Y and then you can put it into rad dose which is freely available and calculate what your dose is and get some idea if you're coming near the limit. So the current status in radiation damage in protein crystals is that we understand a lot more than we did 12 years ago but still not nearly enough um, to give experimenters clear steers on how to um, actually uh, optimize the dose lifetime of their crystals. We've got some really um, uh, exciting new approaches and the 
fact that radiation damage has actually been used to uncover some uh, mechanistic um, uh, uh, mechanistic uh, biology is really exciting. Many complementary methods are now being used, so a Raman spectroscopy, online UV-Vis, which we've used quite a lot, in concert with crystallography, and that gives us more information and allows us to understand better what is going on. Um, you must know the incident flux density to be able to do um, a, a uh, significant radiation damage experiment, otherwise you can't plot the x-axis, and that's a serious problem if you want to compare it with results from the rest of the world. Radiation damage, though, uh, has become a mainline, mainstream concern in protein crystallography, so being aware of it is a good start. I'd like to end this lecture uh, by mentioning my father, who um, was an electrical engineer turned uh, vicar of the Church of England, who, when I said I was going to uh, lecture at Oxford, he said, did I know the definition of a lecture? He said, a lecture is an event where information passes from the notes of the lecturer to the notes of the student without going through the brains of either. This is him uh, at his 80th birthday picnic. Um, he, he was also blind. He was an amazing man, an inspiration to me. I changed this recently, well, about five years ago, to passes from the laptop of the lecturer to the laptop of the student without going through the brains of either. But I've now changed it again today so that it's from the laptop of the lecturer to the World Wide Web of the student. So thank you all very much for listening, and I'd like to thank my group, um, uh, my current group, who are um, Oli, Oliver Zeldin, Marcus um, Gerstel, Ari Jal Abu Hamid, uh, Young Chow, uh, John ben Brembridge, who uh, those two only started uh, two weeks ago, um, and my previous CFIL students, project students, um, and postdocs, all of whom have been uh, wonderful to work with on radiation damage problems, and our current collaborators, Robin Owen from Diamond and Ian Carmichael from Notre Dame Radiation Lab in the USA, who keeps us right on the radiation chemistry. And uh, thank you all um, for listening.